This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, is sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seaborn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com. It's Get Out of Here. I'm Warren Levinson. Norway is a small country, but one of the world's most scenic If you're into graceful and dramatic coastal views, what with its inlets, islands, and fjords, the nation of some 5 million has more than 62,000 miles of coastline. It's excellent hiking territory. But so much of it is steep and deeply forested, so it's not always all that accessible to the casual hiker, which is partly what attracted AP correspondent Brian Witte to a Holland America cruise up and down the Norwegian coast, crossing the Arctic Circle last spring. It wasn't Brian's first trip to Norway or his first European cruise. He joined us to tell us what made this one so special. Brian Woody, let's talk about this cruise to Norway and to the Arctic Circle. First of all, what made you want to go? Well, I I like to go to places that are a little off the beaten path, uh, and this certainly fit that. uh, And I also had some family members who kind of are the same way, and they kind of wanted to go. So kind of made a, uh, a family trip out of it, uh, uh, a family uh, adventure up to the Arctic Circle with making some, uh, some stops at some beautiful places along the way. How long a trip was it? It was two weeks. And now you're no stranger to cruises and cruises in Europe. Where have you been and how does this differ from the ones you've been to before? I've been on some before. I've been in uh, some cruises in the Mediterranean uh, and also I did one in, in the Baltics, and this one was different in that uh, while those are kind of more destination-based, so like uh, just making, making stops in cities, um, this, this was different in that it was more uh, scenic-oriented. Those, you, uh, you, make, you make stops in some, in some wonderful places, but, but while you're on the ship, you, you're ten, you tend to be uh, at sea. Uh, which which is fine and is wonderful but uh, and very relaxing, but uh, there 's not a heck of a lot of, of scenery outside of of the of the water. Uh, this one was different in that uh, it was a lot more scenic uh, along the way, uh, going into the the fjords of Norway, being able to see mul- multi- a multitude of of waterfalls and uh, the long, narrow uh, uh, inlets with, with steep sides, and um, uh, you see the towns along the way, which are very small and sort of dwarfed by the large uh, mountains that are uh, towering over them. It's, uh, it was a very pleasant way of, of seeing uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff. I mean, we, we, the whole trip was about 3,500 miles. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of that wa- was, uh, while some of that was out at sea, a lot of it was uh, uh, inside fjords and along the coastline where, where you could see towns go by, small villages, and also just lots of uh, uh, natural wonders. So basically, I mean, it's like uh, in going in and out of fjords, it's, uh, y- you must get really close to the, to the uh, shoreline. You do. You get you get very close. Some some places closer than others. Some of the some of the fjords we went into were, were narrower than others. And uh, uh, I mean, I was able with a with a telephoto lens on my camera, I was able to take pictures of uh, uh, villages and even see uh, get pretty um, uh, specific photographs of of buildings. Uh, it was uh, you got pretty close indeed. I mean, it sounds a little bit like. Um, hiking without actually getting the hiking boots on and putting the day pack on and, you know, and, and trying to climb uh, the hills and, and going over the tree roots to get into nature. Yeah, it, it absolutely was like that. It was, it was sort of like going on a, on a day-long hike with, without leaving the, the, uh, the comfort of your floating hotel. I mean, you can sit at the bar and watch it go by. You can 
have dinner and, and uh, watch the scenery pass and uh, go about doing all kinds of things on the ship and you have all of this, all of this stuff going by around you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was heavily based on uh, appreciating nature and uh, there was plenty of beautiful stuff to see along the way. Now, you know, you're going into a fjord, out of a fjord, into another fjord. I mean, at some point, did you just say, oh, you know, I've seen this thing before? Uh, you know, when, that, when you do start to feel that way, you uh, have plenty of things to go do uh, uh, away from it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, uh, you can socialize, meet with people, uh, uh, have, have long dinners and watch it go by. And, uh, but then, you know, it always seemed like there uh, while it never really got that old, I mean, sure, there were times when you'd, you'd felt like you had enough and you'd take a break and go do something, but, but then there would always be something uh, special coming along, like uh, uh, a, a unique, I remember we, uh, we were in the, um, uh, what's known as the Sognefjord, which is one of the longest and deepest ones, and it's, it's one of the more famous ones, and we were inside there, and we happened to go by a, um, uh, a pretty well-known town called uh, uh, Erns, where there is one of those uh, famous uh, stave churches. And um, you, could, you could see that we were close enough that uh, with some binoculars, uh, or in my case, taking pictures through the telephoto lens, I could, I could see the church very well. And it was, uh, it was quite something. I mean, an architectural marvel uh, from... Uh, uh, I believe as far back as the as the twelfth century. So you, you'd see something spectacular like that at one point, and then every now and then you would come up to uh, an especially large waterfall, or you might come across uh, some uh, uh, particularly picturesque village uh, with the very green uh, backdrop with all of the trees that they have. It was, uh, there was always, it always, you always, uh, you were, you were always able to see something interesting after a while to, to keep it of interest. And what about actual hiking? Did you actually get an opportunity, um, if, if somebody wanted to, to be able to stop and, and wander through the woods? Absolutely. Um, basically you would, I remember in some of the fjords we went into, you would, you would uh, enter the fjord in the morning, at, like very early in the morning, like uh, 6 a.m., and people would get up and have their coffee or uh, maybe some breakfast and, and sort of watch as we um, flowed into the fjord. And then it would make a stop uh, at a village or a town about four hours later, and it would be about 10 o'clock or so, or maybe 9 or maybe a little earlier, and that would be the time where uh, you could certainly get out and, and do some real hiking. Uh, and, and usually you would be in the town for, you know, most of the day until about 4 or 5 o'clock. And um, you would have plenty of time to either do some hiking or, or take, a, take a bus ride into the mountains or uh, wherever, uh, whatever might be near where the stop was. And what kind of um, clientele did this particular trip attract? Was it the same sort that you might see on other cruises, or was it different in some way, or were you able to tell? You know, it, it, was, uh, it was older. It was an older, it was many, a lot of older people were on this one. Uh, that might have been the fact that it, um, uh, it was kind of an off-the-beaten-path one that what might not be a, uh, one of the first one, cruises one would ever go on. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, it enabled you to see quite a bit without nece necessarily having to be super physically active, uh, it kind of lended itself well to, uh, to folks who are older and, and maybe not quite as, as mobile as they once were. You've been to Norway before. How's this, uh, what did you see before and how's this different? I was I was in Norway about a dozen years ago, and it was part of a uh, a trip I made in Scandinavia. made made stops in in Denmark and 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 Sweden as well. And on that on that uh, trip, of course, you, I think I you know, I think as a lot of people are, you're you're kind of drawn to uh, some of the main main sites, uh, the main cities like Oslo and and went to Bergen. Um, but this one this this uh, trip. Because of where it went, it went so far north. Uh, it uh, 
it brought you to some places that you might not necessarily think of going uh, the first time you think of, of going to Norway. So that was also kind of an added uh, bonus of the trip, I thought. Now, the ship also does, it's not just um, up close and personal encounters uh, with the sides of fjords. It did stop in some ports, and you did get to actually look at other Norwegian cities, as you say, cities that are not the ones you ordinarily would go to, like Bergen or Oslo. So tell me uh, about some of your um, city adventures on this trip. Or should I say town adventures? Yeah. Uh, one of the first ones we stopped in was uh, uh, Stavanger, uh, which is a coastal town, uh, which was known for, uh, became known, uh, important in the oil e exploration uh, since, the, since the 70s. Uh, another nice thing about this trip was that the ports, when the when the when the ship uh, docked, it would be a lot of times it would be right next to the town, uh, so you wouldn't need to take a a bus or a train to get where you wanted to go. For example, uh, at at this stop, um, the ship pulled right up to the old town, which was very beautiful. It's uh, bright white wooden buildings with orange tiled roofs and uh, you were able to just basically walk right off the ship and start strolling in this old town uh, and there were a number of sites in the town they had an old canning museum an old fish cannery uh, dating to the late 19th century where they um, produced sardines is kind of an interesting uh, little stop for a little while and and then there's a beautiful old stone cathedral that uh, dated to the 1100s had uh, unique Baroque, Gothic, and Romanesque elements to it. And, and then you had a modern, a very modern building, a very sleek modern design of the, uh, the Norwegian Petroleum Museum that uh, uh, has a, uh, a very modern, very modern interactive displays that lay out the history of oil exploration uh, uh, in Norway. Uh, and then that was one of the larger towns, and then we would, um, there were some of the smaller villages where you could go and you would do your hiking, those being in the, kind of in the fjords. Uh, but then, you know, at other really uh, prominent stops, we stopped in a really beautiful town, uh, town called Olesund, which was uh, destroyed in a huge fire in 1904, and then uh, rather rapidly rebuilt uh, in, the, um, in the Art Nouveau style. Uh, it was a very, very beautiful, very scenic town. It was almost, uh, the downtown area was almost like a large open-air museum for, for architecture. It was just very pleasant to walk around. And, and again, the ship docked right next to the downtown. You were within um, a very short walk uh, of, of things. And you, it was very easy to do things on your own if you wanted to. Uh, the the uh, cruise line had... Uh, uh, plenty of tours that you could go on if you wanted to, uh, that they would lead. Um, but otherwise, it was very easy to just go about it on your own, just being mindful uh, what time you had to be back at the ship. Uh, so um, there were a lot of other nice stops, too. We stopped in a town called uh, Trondheim, which I had never even heard of before. Uh, it's Norway's third largest city and one of the country's oldest. It has a beautiful Gothic cathedral uh, with incredibly striking stained glass windows and um, it's a very photogenic city. They have a, a, this a, a river that's lined with these brightly brightly colored uh, uh, historic warehouses. Um, so um, it was just a, a lot of the towns were just very very pleasant to stroll around in. This is Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast. We're talking with uh, AP correspondent Brian Woody about his uh, recent trip uh, on a cruise to northern Norway in the Arctic Circle. We'll be back after a break. Download the AP News app for the latest in news, sports, travel, entertainment, and more. Available now for iPhone and iPad. It's Get Out of Here. I'm Warren Levinson talking with the AP's Brian Woody. So, uh, Brian... Uh, to the extent that Americans know about Norway, it's far north, it's cold, you went in the spring, what was the weather like? You know, it, uh, it was late May and early June. Uh, the weather was really, well, it, it's very funny because the uh, folks on the cruise ship, and you would always want to try to get a, an idea of what the weather would be like the next 
the next day, you know, do I need to bring an umbrella? Am I, am I, do I need to bring a, a, do I need to dress in layers? Do I need to wear a heavy coat? All of which I brought uh, to be prepared because we were indeed going to some cold places. Um, but uh, it's the, the kind of the running joke uh, was, well, in, in, in Norway you can experience all four seasons in one afternoon. Uh, which is what I found to be only a, a mild exaggeration. You, you really can have some very fast changing uh, uh, weather. It can it can be raining in the mor- it can be raining uh, in a 15 minute period, and then 15 minutes later it's brightly sunny, and then uh, a half hour later uh, the clouds are coming in again, and it it just moves very very swiftly, uh, which is kind of nice because it gives you uh, a variety of uh, uh, of different uh, uh, things, different ways of looking at things, and different, different uh, color, and on the reflecting off of the water. If you like to take photographs, and 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 if you if you saw if it started out one way that you didn't like, you usually could be pretty confident that it would change to uh, a more pleasant uh, sort of weather later in the day. But then it would probably also tr- change back. So it, it was very. Uh, it was very fast moving, and it could uh, it could be a great variety of things, but for the most part, it wasn't terribly cold. Uh, when we got to the more northern stops, and uh, after we went across the Arctic Circle, uh, it did indeed get cold, but it was bearable. Uh, I had I brought sweaters and layers and a heavy parka and a hat, and uh, that all was uh, that was all it, that was all I needed. Tell me about the Arctic Circle uh, aspect of this of this trip. What part of the attraction was that, and and how did it? How did you know you were across the Arctic Circle? Well, it's a, it was kind of a fun feature of the trip, and of course, going at this time of year, uh, you have the uh, very long days where uh, there were parts of the trip where you had daylight for twenty four hours. So uh, that was kind of a a fun and interesting experience to. Uh, be out at uh, uh, one in the morning and it, and it looking like it was uh, four o'clock in the afternoon uh, where the sun was still up and the sun never set. Uh, so that that was a kind of a nice feature. And you, you really, it's, I, they never made an announcement like you have arrived. I guess you kind of would ask around. And I, I remember at the end of the trip, we got a, they gave a, out a certificate telling people when they, when they arrived into the Arctic Circle and when they left. We were there for about three days, but the the defining characteristic of it, of course, is the uh, the twenty four hour daylight, um, which is fairly interesting. Um, we made two stops uh, up there. Uh, we stopped in the town of Hammerfest, which is known as uh, the world's northernmost city. It has a population of about eight thousand people, and um, it's a, it's a, you know it's an interesting town. Uh, we, again, I basically just got out and walked around. Uh, they have a little tourism center known as the um, and, and a place inside of it known as the the Royal and Ancient Polar Bear Society, which is inside the town city hall. It, it was founded in 1963 with the idea of preserving uh, the Hammerfest tradition of hunting and fishing. It includes a lot of uh, stuffed animals and uh, some uh, exhibits dealing with how people lived and the challenging uh, weather they have there sometimes. And then um, we also made a stop in uh, Honigsvog, which was uh, uh, interesting. And, uh, kind of the main, one of the main things you would do there is take a bus to the North, C- North Cape, which is uh, considered to be the northernmost part of Europe that is... Uh, uh, accessible by car, and it has very sweeping views out over the sea. And there is a visitor center there with uh, uh, a shop and some places where you can take in the scenery and uh, uh, a movie theater that shows a film about about the area. So um, that, of course, uh, and it was kind of interesting to be that far north and thinking about where you are in the world. Uh, it was still about. 1,300 miles from the North Pole, but you're, you're uh, pretty far north at that point, uh, and uh, kind of an interesting ride up to the North Cape where you can take in the scenery and uh, maybe even see a couple of reindeer. Did you find yourself daydreaming at some point in those northern places um, 
what must it like to actually live up here in this particular atmosphere with the sweeping views and the, you know, long light in the win- in the summer and short light in the winter? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, it, it would be an interesting place to live, no doubt about it. Um, I, uh, it would be, I'm sure the, the winters must be really, uh, which I did not experience in any way, shape, or form, but those would be, uh, those would take some getting used to, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, it's kind of interesting to have that day, all of that daylight, too. So uh, I guess you kind of make that, uh, make that, that, uh, that trade off. Um, but it, uh, it's very remote. You feel very far away from things. Uh, and it's kind of interesting in that respect. Well, we can't talk about this without talking about what uh, is uppermost in a lot of people's minds, which is climate change. I mean, do you see um, evidence anywhere? Is it on people's minds? We keep hearing about things like um, ice melt uh, in northern latitudes, uh, giant ice melt in Greenland, for instance. So is there a sense that people very in northern Norway are very much aware that things are changing? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I remember the, um, the, uh, the oil museum in Stavanger had, had an exhibit uh, about mentioning climate change. And then, you know, as you would go around, you would kind of look. A lot of these places were right on the water uh, and um, uh, either on the fjord or on a river, a river running through a, one of the cities. Uh, and, I, I mean, I, 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 I didn't really see any evidence of, of flooding there. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really. And it is kind of interesting to be uh, that far north and, and uh, not necessarily feel uh, as feel that it is as, as cold as you might think, as you would might expect it to be. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely something that people are thinking about and talking about. But uh, not like I wasn't really able to observe anything uh, other than, like I say, it was, you, you're up there and you're thinking, hmm, it's, not really, it's not really that cold and we're pretty far north. But uh, then again, it was summer. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's it, you know, it, it depending on how you're thinking. At any place you go now, uh, in a coastal location, you can it, you can't help but think, well, what would this be like with like a a foot higher sea level? And um, that kind of changes things. Okay, what are you dying to tell me that I've left out here? What do, what do you want to make sure everybody knows about this trip? Uh, I think we've covered it pretty well. I mean, we also um, as we came back, you know, you go you make the trip up there, very far north. And then you come back and you make, uh, you go back into the fjords again, and you see uh, more, some more of that spectacular uh, scenery. Uh, and then also made the uh, one of the last stops in the in the town that I uh, that I mentioned I'd been to a dozen years ago, the town of Bergen. Very beautiful, very beautiful town with uh, a lot of history to it, uh, and. Uh, uh, it, was, it was one of the more cosmopolitan places that we stopped. It had had lots of culture and large fish market and uh, uh, some really impressive art museums, and including one that had a, a couple of rooms of their, uh, their famous painter, Edvard Munch. So uh, that, was a very, that was a very pleasant highlight uh, at the end there, stopping in the, the beautiful town of Bergen. Well, that's great. Well, this, this is the, um, you know, the, uh, essentially the goal in every story we do on this show is uh, at the end of the interview, um, do you want to go there? Well, I definitely want to go there, and I'm uh, a little jealous that you got to go. But Brian Whitty, thanks a lot. Absolutely. It's a beautiful place. Brian Whitty is an Associated Press correspondent in Maryland, covering politics and government from the state capital in Annapolis. By way of disclosure, we should note Holland America's parent company, Carnival, is a sponsor of this podcast. A postscript on Brian's trip, just after he left Norway, the Oil and Gas Museum in Stavanger mounted a major exhibit on the challenges presented by climate change, a big threat to a country so culturally dependent on its coastline, to say nothing of one that's become economically dependent on the fossil fuel industry. And now, my favorite trip. 
Robert Benchley, the Algonquin roundtable humorist, famously said traveling with children corresponds roughly to traveling third class in Bulgaria. Bethany Joy Lenz might beg to differ. She's one of the stars of the USA TV series Pearson, a spin-off of Suits, now best known as the employer of Meghan Markle before she went off to become Duchess of Sussex. Lenz is back from a great trip she took through Europe with her daughter, and she told our entertainment writer Alicia Rancilio all about it. Uh, for a month, we just we just kicked off. And how is it traveling for a month with a child in Europe? It was great. She's eight, so she's totally capable of, you know, walking, <laughs> carrying her own. The first day, uh, I had, so I, here's what we did. We did a month in Europe, uh, two carry-ons, two backpacks. I was, I'm not, I was not messing around with, with checked luggage in all the different places we were going. So... Okay, so we put her backpack on, and then she starts dragging her carry-on, which was pretty light, and it was within, you know, 30 minutes. <laughs> it's too heavy. Can't do it. And I'm thinking, oh, this is good. Yeah, she's going to get strong. Okay. And she, sure enough, you know, within two days, she was like, oh, it's not that bad. It's fine. And, you know, it was so cool to watch her just get stronger and have the wonder of all the seeing all the things and talking to people who are the same but they speak a different language or finding out about different customs that are you know people that function completely differently than we do and um you know she's really young still so i don't know that she was really cognizant of all of that but i i hope and believe that it was like slowly working its way in there i tried to point things out as much as possible that's so cool it was great it was really great yeah is traveling something that's very important to you it is. Um, I, I There's a part of me that's like, oh, you've seen one cobblestone road, you've seen them all, you know. But the pe- people, are, people are the same all over. And the differences are always interesting to me. Um, because on a, on a level of human nature, you know, we all sort of wrestle with the same issues, the same wants and desires, but how we go about doing it based on our cultural Petri dish. It must be interesting as a mom, though, because you want to raise your child to be a citizen of the world. Yeah. You know, so I th- that's why I, th- I think that's great to take her on that trip. Yeah. yeah, I want her to be exposed to all different kinds of things, to have empathy for all different cultures and, and just be able to go anywhere and adapt quickly. We spent a lot of time... Uh, I made sure we would get to airports and train stations early so that she could tell us where we were going. You know, I'd teach her how to look at the ticket, how to, you know, who to talk to if you don't know how to find directions and things like that. So it was fun. Was she involved in the packing of the carry-on? And- <laughs> no. <laughs> she was sitting in the corner watching I Love Lucy on my computer, like, good luck, Mom. <laughs> Sucking on a lollipop or something. I tried, but you can get to pick your battles, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Bethany Joy Lenz is a star of Pearson on the USA Network. She spoke with our Alicia Rancilio. And that's the show. Get Out of Here is a production of the Associated Press, produced under the supervision of Peter Costanzo and Mikesa Moody. I'm Warren Levinson. We'll see you next time. This episode of Get Out of Here, the AP Travel Podcast, was sponsored by Carnival Corporation, the world's largest cruise company with 10 of the world's leading brands, including Carnival Cruise Line, Cunard, Holland America Line, Princess Cruises, and Seabourn. To learn about the world's leading cruise lines from Carnival Corporation and great vacation options, contact your travel professional or visit worldsleadingcruiselines.com.